Okay, good morning again, and uh, these are my disclosure. And um, although I'm not uh, an interventionist, uh, I'd like to answer the question of the last speaker, whether in the last uh, case, revascularization would have avoided uh, an acute myocardial infarction, and my answer is uh, probably yes. But it is very, very easy to say this uh, uh, afterward. The problem is that we need to know when to revascularize a priori, before. And that, uh, although it seems a simple topic, actually it is a rather difficult topic, at least for me. What we are talking about is uh, a coronary obstruction which is causing a lack of oxygen to support the mitochondrial oxidation because that is what oxygen is important for, to allow the mitochondria to produce the right amount of ATP to support contraction. That results in ischemia, which is uh, just a metabolic disease of the myocyte, and this is what we tend to forget. Always our image of ischemia is just an obstruction of the coronary artery. If ischemia is short, that causes angina and what we call uh, chronic uh, uh, coronary artery disease, which mainly is uh, a symptomatic description of something going wrong at the metabolic of the myocyte or if it's prolonged, a myocardial infarction. Now, I have several questions which I will try to answer. First of all, what is chronic? Is ischemia that is chronic or the coronary obstruction? And the answer is very easy. It is the coronary obstruction because chronic ischemia, by definition, cannot exist if ischemia lasts more than uh, 10, 20 minutes, that will cause a myocardial infarction, and that will be an acute event. Chronic ischemia simply cannot exist. And then the second question, in the era of PCI, is angina or chronic coronary artery disease a rare disease? And that, I'm afraid, is a quite uh, a relevant question, at least uh, in Europe, or at least in uh, my hospital to ask. And uh, I would say that uh, the answer is uh, unexpected because angina, even after in the era of PCI, still is a common disease in Europe. Its prevalence is between 2 to 4% and it goes up to 10% with the aging of the population. This is the incidence. The mortality is quite, uh, is quite something, about 1.5 per year. A lot of morbidity and a lot of cost. So we are talking about a common and important disease. And despite interventional cardiology, angina remains a public health problem. And in Europe, it, uh, it corresponds to 2.6% of the total health expenditure. So we need to know how to treat it and which is the best way of treating it. We are looking at uh, a shift in the epidemiology because it is true that there is a decline of the incidence in the younger. There is, uh, however, an increasing of the population age and that will cause a shift of the burden to the elderly. And because of this increase in the population, we should uh, expect to be confronted with more and more angina patients. And then let's go to the, the other two questions. What do we have to treat? Do we have to treat the local lesions or the overall disease? And which is the goal of treatment? is quality of life or prognosis? And these are also very relevant questions because when we are talking about angina, that is my vision, the vision of an iceberg. And uh, something is going on behind the coronary arteries 
And uh, unfortunately, we come to be worried about that only when something is coming up into the coronary arteries. But all this goes on for years and we cannot ignore it. And that is the classical cardiovascular continuum. And uh, I would say that uh, angina starts at this very age here. It starts with hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, that sometimes we do ignore. That will cause endothelial dysfunction. And if the endothelial dysfunction occurs at the level of the coronary artery, we will have coronary atherosclerosis, and then coronary artery disease, and then myocardial ischemia, and then all the rest. And uh, angina contributes quite importantly to, to cardiovascular morbidity. As you can see here, 1.4% more non-fatal myocardial infarction, and if you look at heart failure, 6.9%, or unstable angina, 6.4%. So really, it's a serious disease. And also is a, a, a disease with a lot of symptoms. This is not at all the life of angina patient. So it is important to treat it. And uh, there are different approaches when we are going to treat coronary artery disease. The, perhaps the most important one is the lifestyle modification. And this is the easiest to say, the more difficult to achieve. Because uh, clearly, with this burden of angina, we cardiologists have been not able to prevent it from occurring. And we could have prevented if we would have in involved a better lifestyle disease in our patients. Then we have the pharmacotherapy which uh, is uh, both for symptoms and for prognosis. And we have certainties here. And then we have the revascularization therapy, which is definitely extremely good for symptoms, question mark for prognosis. And we should look into that. Now, the goal of uh, pharmacotherapy is, uh, on one hand, to prevent myocardial infarction and death. And here we know that we can do that with the antithrombotic therapy, we can do that with lipid lowering agents, and we can do that with the ACE inhibitors. These are facts, and these uh, drugs has to be given to all our patients with angina, independently from cholesterol level, independently from blood pressure. And this is a very strong message, and during my talk this afternoon, I will tell the reason why statins and ACE inhibitor are acting behind cholesterol level and behind the blood pressure reduction. Then we have uh, several drugs which are quite good in order to reduce the symptoms. These are the beta blockers, the calcium blocker, nitrates, ivabradin, and many other drugs. So we do have something important. But the real important things are what I call the fabulous four antiplatelet ACE inhibitor, I should say only with the ramipril and uh, perindopril, statins, perhaps also beta blockers, only if there is heart failure. Because beta blockers with uh, a normal ventricle, they are not improving the prognosis. We can talk about that in the discussion if you like. And then we have a PCI, which is indeed blooming everywhere, which is indeed important, but we do not know if it's the really the right things to do. Why that? Because ischemia in human beings is different than in animals. In human beings, ischemia is a very personal entity. Ischemia or the degree of ischemia depends from the degree of coronary occlusion, but also depends from the pre-existence of collateral flow. It also depends from the pre-existence of the metabolic turnover, and we know very little about that. It depends from genetic factors. It depends from the intrinsic defensive capacity of the myocyte. 
And ischemia is such a personal entity that allows very strange phenomenon like hibernation, if you think carefully, like preconditioning, like stunning, all phenomenon preserving viability. So it is very, very difficult to understand which typology of ischemia is present in our patients for that given coronary obstruction. And that is where we are not really good at. So uh, revascularization, if we want to discuss revascularization for improvement of prognosis, well, I think that today I can provide to you evidence that the revascularization improves death, death, which is the most important of the endpoints, according to what? According to the amount of ischemic burden. And uh, in this trial was evaluated by SPAT. And you can see that when the ischemic burden is um, within, is therapy is uh, better than revascularization. But when we go to high ex uh, uh, ischemic burden, or in other words, when there is a lot of ischemia, then you can see that the revascularization can uh, reduce uh, death much better than medical therapy. And that is the real message. So we do have certainties of revascularization for prognosis when the total ischemic burden is above 10 to 20 percent, which in simple terms, when we are confronting with the free vessel disease, with the left main, with the proximal LED, with or without diabetes, and of course diabetes is a reason to prefer cabbage to PCI in terms of revascularization. But then we have also a lot of uncertainties. What to do if the ischemic burden is uh, below 10% or 15%? It has already been uh, uh, named, the COURAGE trial was uh, a real key trial. The, um, probably you know it better than me, rand was randomization to PCI or plus optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy alone. The previous speaker has emphasized that in COURAGE, because it was a trial, it was possible to establish a real, very well-conducted uh, medical therapy and uh, very aggressive lifestyle modification, which is uh, quite difficult to achieve in our patients. These are the lifestyle modifications, and this is the optimal medical therapy. And as you can see, all the patients were almost forced to take all these drugs. The results were quite, are quite very well known, and there was no real differences in the prognosis between adding PCI to this uh, uh, type of uh, medical therapy. And these were the conclusion that uh, as an initial management strategy in patients with stable coronary artery disease, PCI did not reduce the risk of death, myocardial infarction, and other major cardiovascular events. This, of course, was not very well taken by the interventionist, a lot of criticism, and so on. However, even COURAGE showed that when the burden of ischemia is high, PCI may be helpful. And then we two, have the two FAME uh, uh, studies. Two minutes left. Okay. The FAME studies you know better than me, and you have uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, slides in front of your eyes, which is very promising, because when uh, we have certainties about ischemia, we can have uh, uh, important uh, primary outcomes. However, this primary outcomes was constituted by three different, uh, different goals. One, death, 
And if you look, the death of any cause was not really different. Myocardial infarction was also not very different. The only, uh, what only was different was the need of urgent revascularization. And uh, this is quite important because you have to dissect what is in the uh, primary component uh, of the primary endpoint. At uh, five years follow-up, we already heard there was uh, a carry-on of this positive effect of uh, revascularization on top of uh, medical therapy. And uh, just to conclude, what to do when the ischemic burden is low? We need to consider the patient. We need to consider that ischemia is a personal entity. And so try to look if there are viability, if there is a collateral flow and so on. But to me, the real problem is that when you ask, and more importantly, when the patients know that there is an obstruction, it is a very logical thing to take away that obstruction, isn't it? And so it is difficult to convince patients to not to go under... future, the initial data are quite uh, favorable. So, in conclusion, revascularization for stable coronary artery disease, yes, it is efficacious for control symptoms, no question about that. It is also efficacious to improve prognosis according to the extent of ischemic burden, no question about that. However, <coughs> Due to the high subjectivity of patients and typology of ischemia, it may be important also in cases of small ischemic burden. And that is where probably our skill as a doctor is to identify these patients and to suggest them for a PCI. Thank you very much for your attention.